just a moment, you'll hear James Stewart as the Six Shooter, only one of the many fine programs brought to you Sundays on NBC. Each Sunday, listen to the music of the NBC Symphony Orchestra broadcasting from Carnegie Hall. Hear the amusing adventures of Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy in The Marriage, and tune to the NBC Star Playhouse for the nation's greatest stars. It's a lineup of wonderful programs, all of them heard only on NBC. James Stewart as the Six Shooter. The man in the saddle is angular and long-legged. His skin is sun-dyed brown. The gun in his holster is gray steel and rainbow mother of pearl. Its handle unmarked. People call them both the Six Shooter. The NBC Radio Network presents James Stewart as The Six Shooter, a transcribed series of radio dramas based on the life of Britt Ponsett, the Texas Plainsman who wandered through the Western territories, leaving behind a trail of still remembered legends. Now, in just a moment, immediately following this important announcement, you'll hear Act One of The Six Shooter. A Christmas gift with a future. That's how everyone feels about a gift of United States savings bonds. Because when those bonds mature, they pay back $4 for every $3 invested. What's more, they can be held as long as 10 years beyond maturity and earn even further interest. Give a gift of United States savings bonds. Now, Act One of The Six Shooter, starring James Stewart. expected to stay over in Smoke Falls, but when I stopped off to see old Dad Somerset and found him all crippled up with lumbago, well, I, of course, he didn't ask me to look after his stock, but I could see he sure wanted me to, so... Well, a couple of weeks later, I... he began feeling better, so I started thinking about moving on. It was nearly five o'clock in the afternoon that day. The sun just spilled over the top of Eagle Mountain. When the buckboard pulled into the yard. Mr. Ponsett? Oh, evening, ma'am. Mr. Ponsett, I'm Grace Proudly. Oh, pleased to meet you, Miss Proudly. I've been meaning to come out and see how Mr. Somerset's been getting along, but I just never have a minute's free time. It's canning season, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, Dad's feeling much better. If you'd like to talk to him, he's no, right in. No, no, just say that I asked for him. As a matter of fact, it's you I want to talk to, Mr. Ponsett. Oh? You see, I'm president of the Ladies' Aid Society of Smoke Falls. Uh-huh. We're affiliated with the church and do lots of charity work, Christmas baskets and things like that, you know. All the best ladies in town are members, and we don't just take in everybody either. Well, now, I... Now, this I... is what I'm getting at, Mr. Ponson. Tonight's our box supper and square dance. It's an annual event. Mr. Simpling always loans us his barn for the occasion. I've spent the whole afternoon helping with the decorations. Now, Polly Sullivan, that's Wade Sullivan's wife, she's chairman of the decorating committee, but since I'm president, I felt it was my duty to give her a hand. That's what made me so late coming out here to ask you. To ask me? Uh... A- about attending the supper. Oh, oh. No, well, I'm not going to take no for an answer. Oh, but Miss Proudly... To tell I... you the truth, I... Well, I've already told folks you were planning to come. Oh, but you shouldn't have done that. Now, but, after but... all, you're practically the first celebrity we've ever had in Smoke Falls. The auction starts at 7.30. You won't be late, will you, Mr. Ponson? Oh, but And Miss one more Proudly... thing. Would you mind wearing your gun? The men folks are especially interested in that. Get up, Sheba. Come on, Sullivan. Oh, Come but... Uh, wait a... 7.30! Wait a minute, Miss Proudly... Uh... Say there, Miss Proudly. Oh, dear. Well, after I gave Dad his supper, I washed my face and wet down my hair and started off for old man Simpling's barn. When I got there, Miss Proudly met me at the door and introduced me around. The only name that sank in was her daughter, Ellen. Pretty girl. I figured that when the box supper sheet pack was put up for sale, the bidding would be mighty serious. All right, everybody, we're ready to begin the auction. We don't want the music now, Wilbur. Wilbur! Now just gather around the table. 
table here so you can get a good look at what you're buying. But remember, you can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> now, which one shall we start with? Oh, my, look at this one. Pretty pink ribbon and white tissue paper. Why, I'll just bet you there's a whole fried chicken inside this box. Now, who's going to make the first bid? A dollar, 50 cents. Don't forget, gentlemen, a pretty lady's company goes with the supper. I'll give a nickel. <laughs> now, Spud Hooker, you stop joshing. You know we don't take any bid less than the court. Yeah. Now, who wants a quarter just to get things underway? Look at this lovely box. Just think some nice young lady spent the whole day fixing it up. Then she'll be too tired to dance. <laughs> <laughs> The auction was kind of slow in picking up momentum, but when Mrs. Proudly started in to make the third sale, well, there wasn't much doubt whose supper she was selling. Ellen Proudly sort of reddened in the cheeks and tried to look unconcerned. I, I saw her give somebody a glance on the other side of the room, almost like a signal. Couldn't tell who it was intended for, but there were two fellas standing over there. Spud Hooker is one, a tall, husky, about 25. He'd been cracking jokes and acting sort of like he owned the place. The other boy is kind of a different sort. He's thinner, shorter. He hadn't opened his mouth since I got there. Now, let's see if you can't do a little better this time, gentlemen. Here's the next supper. Oh, boy. My, it looks familiar. Oh, I guess I shouldn't have said anything, should I? Ellen will just about murder me when I get home. Oh! Well, as long as the cat's out of the bag, I might as well go ahead with the sale. Fifty cents. Bud Hooker bids fifty cents. A supper like this ought to be worth more than half a dollar. A little bird told me there's a chocolate cake inside. Uh, Seventy-five cents, ma'am. I've got seventy-five. Now, what about it, Spud? You're not going to let Tom Leverett outbid you? Dollar. One dollar. I'm bid. One silver dollar. Who'll give a dollar and a quarter? Dollar and a quarter. Don't forget, gentlemen, it's all for charity. Dollar and a half. Now we're getting somewhere. I'm bid a dollar and fifty cents. Spud Hooker offers a dollar and fifty cents. Are there any more bids? Two dollars. You're bidding two dollars, Tom? Yes, ma'am. Three dollars. Oh, three? That's what I said. Well, now, we all appreciate your enthusiasm, boys. But remember, this isn't the only supper you can buy. It's so the only one I'm buying, and I'll take it right... Four dollars. Huh? Well, all right, all right. Going once, going twice, and it's sold... Five dollars. Now, uh, now, Spud, are I'll you bid sure... six dollars, Miss Crowley. You're oh. making a fool of yourself, Leverett. Ellen wants to eat with me. My, my bid's six dollars. Seven. Now, boys... Ten. Oh, now you don't mean that, Tom. You can't afford ten dollars. No, I mean it. Well, all right. I bid ten dollars. Are there any more bids? Going once, going twice. Go ahead, sell it to him. It ain't going to do him no good. Now we don't want any trouble, Spud. Ellen's my girl, and she's eating with me. I'll take that box, Miss Proudly. Here's your money. Didn't you hear what I said? She's eating with me. Get out of the way, Spud. You're not man enough to make me move. Now give me that box or I'll take it away from you. Okay, Tom, you hurt me. No! No! Hold on here. No. Just a minute here. Now, hold on. It don't concern you, Ponce. No, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't concern me. It just seems to me that there ought to be a better place for settling things. That's all. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Ponce, it's right, Spud. Let's... Well, let's go out. Hey, hey, where, where's Britt Ponsett? Dad Summer said he was over here. Yeah, I'm uh, Ponsett. Oh, uh, Miss Ponsett, uh, Sheriff Tinsmith told me to find you. What's the matter, Jake? Dink Falk just broke out of jail. Oh, yeah, oh, yes. He, he shot the sheriff in the back while he was getting away. Oh, he did. Hey, well, we, we took him over to Doc Foster's, and he's bleeding pretty bad. He, he wants to talk to Mr. Ponsett before... Well, before he... I'll get my horse. Glenn. Glad you got here, Brett, before. Now, now, what are you talking about, Ray? You're going to be all right. The doc says you'll be back on your feet again inside of a week or so. I don't know what I was thinking of. Letting Dent Falk get hold of my gun while I was serving the supper. 
Must be... Must be getting careless in my old age. Now, well, you're not the first man to have trouble with fog. He had a pretty fancy reputation from what I hear. Yeah, that's... That's why I had to see you, Britton. My fault he got loose, and I... I don't want other folks to pay for my mistakes. Well, what do you mean? I know this town, Brett. They'll... I'll get a posse together and start after Falk. Well, that's... And they'll catch him, too. But going out in a crowd like that, he'll hear him coming. Falk's a wildcat killer, Brett. When he's cornered, he won't give up. Pick off three or four of the posse before they can close in. Well, not if they're careful. That's the trouble, though. Fellas here ain't cautious. They're bullheaded, but... But you'd know how to take him, Brett. No, I, I ain't saying it's your duty. You don't even live in Smoke Falls, but... You could capture Falk without him having a chance to... No, no, to... I'm afraid you're giving me too much credit, Ray. If I, you want somebody to go along, any of the boys... Sure, I know that, I'd be I... mighty grateful, Brett. The folks here have been good to me. Wouldn't like to leave them thinking that because of me, because of what I did, some of them was going to... No, 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 you better take it easy. I, I, Just I, I take know, it it's easy. it's asking a lot. Falk's a good shot and a wildcat killer. It's asking... We'll return to James Stewart as the six-shooter in just a moment. Recently, the American Red Cross was called on for immediate and dramatic expansion of its part in the National Blood Program, was asked to make available all the gamma globulin possible for the prevention of paralysis from polio. Experiments conducted over the past two years have demonstrated the effectiveness of this treatment. It takes approximately one pint of blood to make an average dose of gamma globulin as used for polio. And one injection protects a child for a period of one to five weeks. Therefore, there is a tremendous need for blood donations now, so that we may be able to do our utmost to safeguard our children during the epidemic period next summer. At the same time, there has been no let-up in the need for blood for use overseas and for the thousands of wounded men in our military hospitals who are still fighting for a chance to live. If you are an adult, call your local Red Cross chapter right away. Get an appointment to make a donation of your blood for the National Blood Program, which aims to supply the total blood needs of the country. Join the thousands of Americans who are rolling up their sleeves. Take pride in having helped save a life. Now, Act Two of The Six Shooter, starring James Stewart as Britt Ponsett. Sheriff Tinsmith had been right about the town foreman of Posse. They hadn't lost any time. Spud Hooker was taking charge. I was kind of surprised to see that Tom Leverett was along. But I figured he and Hooker sort of joined forces for the time being. How is he, Ponset? Well, he passed out a few minutes ago. Maybe it's just as well. At least he's getting some rest. Yeah, well, we're going after fault. The other boys are waiting behind the mercantile. Uh-huh. Ah. Uh-huh. Looks like you've got quite a gang. I ain't got no objections to having you go along, too. Not that we need you, you understand. Yeah. Well, you coming? Well, I had a little talk with the sheriff just before he lost consciousness. He seemed to think that taking out a posse after Falk wasn't such a good idea. What's he want us to do, let him go scot-free? No, no. No, Sheriff Tinsmith sort of suggested maybe one or two men would have a better chance of catching him. They can make faster time, maybe sneak up on Falk unaware. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, it's okay with me. You going to be one of the boys who goes after him, Ponset? Mm, well, I haven't exactly made up my mind. You better make it up faster. I'll take somebody else. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, well, in that case, I... Whoa, 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 whoa. Say, uh, your name's Leverett, isn't it? That's right, Mr. Ponset. Tom Leverett. Mm-hmm. You want to ride along with me? Huh? What? 
Why, sure. Now, uh, wait a minute here. I thought you said one or two men. Mm-hmm, I did. Well, we don't need Leverett, then. Well, I tell you, I sort of figured maybe you ought to stay in town, Hooker. So if Tom and I get in trouble, well, you could bring the posse out later. Huh? You're trying to make a fool out of me, Ponsett? No, no, I'm not. Everybody knows I'm twice the man Leverett is. I can ride better and shoot faster, and I'll fight him two to one. Mm-hmm. You want the credit for catching Falk yourself, don't you? Well, it ain't going to work out that way. Come on, boy. I'll find Falk myself, and I'll bring him in alone. That's all I have. Hey! Well, Tom, let's go, huh? Fox Trail headed west, up toward Eagle Mountain. And the moon was out, sort of a half moon, but it gave us enough light so we could follow the hoof prints Fox horse had left. Along about midnight, we spotted another trail, fresher. It couldn't have been more than a couple minutes old. It cut in from one side and then went on ahead in the same direction Falk was riding. Ah. You see that, Tom? Yeah. Looks like Spud Hooker took a shortcut. Yeah. You reckon he'll beat us to him? Oh, you never know. Never know. If he does, he might save us some grief, wouldn't he? Huh? <laughs> You're not anxious to tangle with Falk, are you, Mr. Ponson? No, no. No, I'm not anxious to tangle with anybody, Tom. But I thought, well, you brought in other outlaws before. Oh, some. Some, not as many as folks think. But uh, I've never enjoyed tangling with any of them. Why'd you pick me? Spud's right. He is twice the man I am. That's shooting, maybe. Yeah. But there's more to trailing a killer than being able to shoot. You know, lots of times it's more important for a man to know when not to shoot, you know. Huh? Yeah. Well, I was itching to pull a trigger like Spud. Well, he's, he's apt to pull it too soon. And, uh... Hey, look at that. The moon's going down. Yeah. We might as well get some shot eye. Whoa, boy. Whoa, Oh, uh, he couldn't see the trail anyway. Spud won't be stopping for sleep. No, no, I don't suppose he will. That's not a reason I picked you. I... I kind of... Figured he'd want to keep pushing on all night. And, uh, down gun, I... Guy, oh, along about this time, I just get tired. Huh? <laughs> As soon as the morning sun began gray in the sky, we started off again. Falk's trail was winding up the side of Eagle Mountain now. It was pretty hard riding. Tom didn't complain, even though I could see he wasn't used to it. Every once in a while, he almost slid out of his saddle, but somehow he managed to hang on. About noon, we reached Little Creek, and Falk's trail gave out. The other trail, the one we figured was Hooker's, it sort of milled around in all directions and then went off on a tangent. And we climbed down from our horses and got a drink of water. Ah, it tastes good, doesn't it? <laughs> it sure does. You uh, ever been out this way before, Tom? Oh, yeah. Not for the last couple of years, though. Mm -hmm. Any cabins around, place a man could hide out? Well, not that I remember. You think we're getting close to him? Well, he could have gone on using the creek to cover his trail, but he'd have to stop pretty soon. No? Oh, yeah. A man can't keep riding forever. He even Dink Falk. So far, we haven't seen any signs that he made camp, you see. That's so. A giant cave. Hmm? He might be there, Britt. It's not more than a mile away due south. Giant cave? Well, you've heard of it, ain't you? No. No, I don't think I have. Well, it'd be a perfect spot for a man to hold up. Nobody knows for certain just how far back into the mountain the cave really goes. Some... Scientific fellows tried to explore it last summer, but, well, their lanterns gave out before they come to the end. Uh -huh. Well, it sounds like something we ought to see even if Falk isn't there. Come on, let's go and have a look. Oh, uh, that's the entrance. 
entrance there, Britt. Beside that slab of yellow rock. Uh-huh. I don't see any sign of Fox Trail. I guess he could have come up from the other side, though. Yeah, that's what he must have done. Huh? That pony over yonder. That clump of bushes he's grazing. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, Sam. Easy, Scott. Sorrow. Easy, easy, whoa, boy. You know, Jake Watson said Falk stole a sorrow when he made his getaway. Mm-hmm. Now, we'd better close in on foot. We tethered our horses on a couple of spruce saplings and moved into the cave entrance. It wasn't a very big hole. We had to sort of bend over and crawl through it. But the room on the other side, I, that must have been 100 feet long, 50 feet wide. The walls were sheer rock, sort of rainbow colored, so smooth you'd have thought somebody had been polishing them. And then the light behind us got down to a pinpoint. He wouldn't be hiding here in the dark, would he, Britt? Maybe. If he heard us coming. Shh. There's somebody up ahead. Yeah. You got your gun ready? Uh-huh. Now, don't use it unless you're pretty sure of hitting something. If we start shooting, it'll just help his aim. Okay. All right, now back up against the wall here behind you. Falk! We know you're in here, Falk. You go any further, you'll get lost. You'll never find your way out. Hey, you hear me, Falk? <laughs> you're wasting lead. You can't see us. We know that. You can't see me, neither. But we don't have to. You've got to come out sooner or later, and we'll be waiting. All right, we're going to leave you now, Falk. We're going outside and wait. Hey, where you are? You giving up? No, I ain't. And I ain't alone. What? I got somebody with me. Friend of yours, I reckon. We're coming out together. And if you try to stop me, I'll kill him. What's he talking about? He, he ain't lying, Brett. It, it's me, Spud Hooker. Spud? I, I caught up with him last night, but he, but he got the draw on me. Hold your fire, Britt. He means what he says. He'll kill me if you don't hold your fire. You've got to do what he told you, Britt. You've got to. All right, Bob, come on. Start backing up towards the entrance. I don't hear you moving. Britt, please. All right, let's go, Tom. We backed out into the daylight, Tom and me, and waited for them. About a minute later, Spud Hooker marched through the mouth of the cave, half scared to death. Dink Falk was right behind him, holding a forty-five aimed at the small of Spud's back. I was pretty sure he wouldn't hesitate to pull the trigger either. Sheriff Tinsmith was right. He's just a wildcat killer. He had that stampede look in his eyes as he stood there blinking against the sun. Same kind of a look you see in a steer when the herd's shoving him along. He can't stop or be trampled to death. Hang off your guns. Both of you. Take them off or I'll fix your friend here. Falk gave Spud a shove with his gun and he jumped forward. There was an opening now between him and Falk. The next thing I knew, Tom dived forward. Get out of Spud! Tom tackled Spud and he rolled over. The bullet missed him, but Tom was in range and he took it. Falk aimed to fire again and I managed to get my gun out. The bullet hit his thigh and spun him around. Then his leg buckled and he fell face down. He hadn't let go of the pistol yet. He started to bring it up. Drop it, Falk! For a second, his finger went right on squeezing the trigger, but... No, nah, he just didn't have the strength. <sighs> Tom? Tom, you all right? Uh, sure. Yeah, it's hardly bleeding. I... I should have let Falk alone. I should have let you handle him, Britt. Well, I don't know. Looks to me like Tom did most of the handling around here. I mean, if it hadn't been for him, yeah. you know, it's... I guess I had you figured wrong, Tom. I never thought you'd be the one to save me, but... I wasn't saving you, Spud. Huh? I don't like you. I never did. And nothing's going to change that. 
Then why? I like Ellen. I like her a lot, but... Well, she's in love with you. If you got yourself killed, it would just hurt her and wouldn't do me no good. Ellen, tell you she's in love with me? She didn't have to. When she finds out what happened today... She ain't going to find out. I'm going to tell her. I'm going to tell her myself. I don't want her to know. It's for me to decide. Now listen here, Spud Hooker. You do the listening for a chance. No, I thought you I thought you were listening last now, night, but it looks now, like... Now, 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 hold on, hold on now. Now, I think we ought to get Tom to a doctor, don't you? If we don't, Alan won't have no way of choosing him, even if she wanted to. Now, come on, Spud. Come on, give me a hand. We tied Falk onto the back of his pony and started off for town. I sure didn't know what Alan was going to do about Spud and Tom. Oh, you never know what a woman's going to do when it comes to, you know, falling in love and marrying and all that sort of thing. But I did know one thing. Uh, that, that picking Tom to go along with me, I, I'd been a pretty good choice. Probably could do a whole lot worse, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, the tradition of religious freedom and of religious worship in America goes back to the very founding of our country. So, in these days of world crisis, when our nation and all its citizens need spiritual strength and guidance, all of us should think again of what religion means to us and to our country. For it's religious faith that makes our way of life possible. During November, people of many faiths are joining in a great Religion in American Life campaign. So, whatever your faith may be, you are asked to join in this campaign. Be sure to attend and support the church or synagogue of your choice. And if you have children, by all means, light their life with faith. Bring them to worship this week. The Six Shooter is an NBC Radio Network production in association with Review Productions. It is based on a character created by Frank Burt, and the transcribed story is written by him. Mr. Stewart may currently be seen in the Universal International picture Thunder Bay. Others in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Frank Gerstel, Robert Griffin, Forrest Lewis, and Sam Edwards. Special music for this program was by Basil Edwards, and the entire production is under the direction of Jack Johnstone. All characters and incidents were fictitious, and any resemblance to actual characters or incidents is purely coincidental. And incidentally, a great many of our friends have written in to thank us for putting the six-shooter on the air. And a surprising number of letters have requested the name of the theme you are listening to right now and where it might be obtained. Well, we're sorry, but it is music that has been recorded exclusively for broadcast and is therefore not available for home use. But we are grateful nonetheless to all of you who have written. Your kind letters are always welcome. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Tonight, here's Celeste Holm in the NBC Star Playhouse on the NBC Radio Network. <laughs>